Welcome to Westpac's Packaging Dynamics webinar number three, entitled Determining the Vibration Sensitivity and Shock Fragility of Products, Methods, Results, and Insights. I am Tim Eels, and I will be your moderator and webinar organizer today. Before we start, let's take a moment to ensure that everyone is ready and familiar with the webinar control panel. First, you should have a control panel on the right side of your screen. You can minimize this panel by clicking on the orange arrow button in the upper left corner. You may expand the panel by clicking the same button. Secondly, you have the ability to submit questions using the chat pane located near the bottom of the control panel. We will be answering a few minutes of questions during today's webinar. However, if we are unable to address your specific question, one of our presenters will follow you up with you by email afterwards. Today's webinar and video slide deck should be available on Westpac's website tomorrow. Well, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Today's webinar presenters are Herb Schunemann and Edmund Tang. You may remember both gentlemen from the previous Packaging Dynamics webinars. Edmund is a lab manager here at Westpac and a lecturer on packaging at nearby San Jose State University. Herb is president and CEO here at Westpac as well as a past lecturer at San Jose State. Herb, you're our first presenter today. Take it away. Thank you, Tim, and uh, welcome everyone to our third in a series of five webinars in which we're looking at uh, Packaging Dynamics, the uh, shock and vibration uh, technology behind determining uh, how to optimize protective package systems. Um, the first thing that uh, we're going to do is go over a little bit of the webinars one and two so that we can uh, pull those the, the relevant points, uh, some of the relevant points back uh, together. Uh, we're going to talk about the, uh, the old stimulation versus simulation uh, uh, conundrum, if you will. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, the concept of resonance and vibration sensitivity, how those play together. Uh, we'll then go into a shock fr fragility, how they how things break, and and how we do that in a method to tell us something about our our process and our optimum package system. Uh, we'll do a little bit of uh, the instrumentation required. We'll just touch on that and uh, take your questions. So that's what we have uh, planned uh, for today. So fasten your seat belts because it's going to be a quick ride. Here we go. First thing we'd like to do is to um, review some of the relevant portions of webinar one. We went through the history and background of packaging dynamics. Uh, we talked about the terms of the trade. Uh, I call it the lingo. Um, and we emphasized the uh, difference between the time domain and the frequency domain representations of what we do and, and uh, how we do that, especially for a vibration. Uh, we looked at uh, then some of the common uh, packaging hazards in the distribution environment, uh, vibration uh, and impact are the, the ones that we focus in on, but we'll, we also talked about uh, compression and altitude a little bit and things like that. Okay. So that was uh, pretty much webinar number one. Um, we, uh, we went into the difference between the input and response rather extensively, and uh, um, what we found was that, uh, that, that uh, it, it makes a big deal of difference whether we're measuring the input uh, or the response. Um, so um, Edmund talked about this extensively, and uh, so I'm going to ask him to take it over from here. Thank you, Herb. So with the input and response, um, you could think about it with an input. Everything, your package, your product will always see an input. And if you're on a truck, you know, all the packages will really see the in same input. But the response is the key factor, the key aspect of a package design. Because how your package system, how your product inside responds to that input is what determines whether a package is successful or not, to say the least. So right here on this graph, we have a shock input on top, which is, which is the blue line. And it's a pretty sharp spike, and you can see it, it's around 450 Gs. And then on bottom, we have the response, and then we take that um, G levels, and then we mitigate it, and we only see around 200 Gs. So you can see that the response is almost half of what the input was. So 
with this webinar, we're going to review webinar number two in a very brief fashion. And webinar number two was all about defining the environment. So what does it mean to actually define the environment? So when you define an environment, you're quantifying all the hazards capable of causing damage to our product. So if you think about it, impacts, obviously, when your package drops or your product drops, um, maybe your product will see damage depending on how it's cushioned. With vibration, every single time that you ship a product, it's always going to see vibration. It doesn't matter what you ship it as, vibration is an unavoidable hazard that always occurs. Temperature, humidity extremes, hot and cold, moist and dry. Top load compression, mainly when it's either warehouse stacked or stacked on a vehicle. So it just sees um, pretty much how much box compression strength your box can take before it starts to buckle and your product starts being top load. And then for altitude testing or altitude extremes, for maximum altitude exposures for truck and also aircraft shipments. So when we quantify the distribution environments, where can we get the sources of information? So the sources of information that we could get is number one, and this is probably the best way to quantify your distribution environment is for direct measurement of the distribution environment. And with webinar number two, what we did was that we introduced what is known as ride recorders, or you can, um, we used an example of a saver system. And this system pretty much, when we put it in a package, when you put it in a truck bed, it tells you exactly what vibration it's seeing during the vibration portion of shipment and the exact number of drops that you see during the drop portions of the hazards. You can look at literature search or historical records, for instance, what your company either compiled or just literature search online to see what they have available because some data is definitely there. Observation, you're looking directly at what's happening in the distribution environment and noticing where the drops come from and where the um, or how quote unquote intense your vibration is or damage claims at the end of the shipment you look at your packages and you or your units and you say okay you know we have this amount of damage and it's probably caused by this other concerns when you're collecting data is the cost of data collecting data is if you want to do it right it's probably going to um, take quite a um, one it's going to cost uh, quite a bit of funds and then more importantly it's time to collect data because you have to wait until all the shipments are completed you have to cycle through all the data and see what's valid and what's not valid and that's the other concern which is the val validity of the data okay thank you Edmund um, so that that pretty much uh, uh, covers the first two webinars uh, during this webinar we're going to focus on uh, defining uh, product fragility. This, this is kind of the, the meat of the matter, the heart and soul, if you will. Um, by uh, defining the fragility or sensitivity of product through dynamic inputs, primarily shock and vibration, we're able to uniquely tailor the uh, product and package to the intended distribution environment in, in an optimum way. Uh, no more guessing, no more, uh, you know, guessing about materials and, and uh, no more embarrassment about products being damaged in shipment, uh, no more embarrassment about uh, wasteful overpackaging. So that's really what we're going to be focusing on today. Okay. Uh, you remember the uh, bar chart from our last webinar. This is the, uh, the chart that was uh, ingeniously put together by uh, Mr. Bill Kipp, formerly of the Landsman Corporation. Many of you know him. Uh, true genius of the industry, in my opinion. Um, we detailed last time the uh, the process necessary to quantify the first bar, namely the uh, uh, the environment. Uh, we went over the process of quantifying the distribution environment in terms of the hazards uh, to shipping products through there. During this webinar, we'll teach you how to quantify the second bar, namely uh, quantifying the sensitivity of your products to uh, uh, vibration and shock. Okay, some terms you got to remember here. That, uh, again, terminology is important. Uh, during our first uh, webinar, as you recall, uh, we commented that uh, speaking the right language uh, or the right lingo is uh, critical. Uh, oftentimes, we ourselves are guilty of using different terms for the same thing. That's certainly uh, the case with uh, the terms fragility and sensitivity and ruggedness, among others. 
Um, they're all the same thing as far as packaging dynamics is concerned. Also recall that uh, fragility is not a black box item. Uh, it's simply a characteristic of your product, just like uh, color or weight or physical dimensions. These other characteristics are measured by means of a scale or a colorimeter or something similar. Fragility is likewise measured by means of dynamic inputs such as uh, shock and vibration. So what constitutes uh, damage or failure? Um, it's absolutely essential to determine and to define what, what, the, uh, what the answers to that question really are. Uh, I know it sounds like a relatively uh, simple assignment, but it winds up being one of the most uh, difficult uh, questions to answer during the testing. Uh, uh, solve this problem early by defining exactly what constitutes damage or failure to the product. We uh, often have uh, uh, situations where you know, uh, something has a, a minor or cosmetic uh, a defect in it that uh, it takes a pretty keen eye to, to see. Uh, so you really have to determine what what uh, what constitutes a damage or failure to their product. It's an important point. Uh, over the years, we have found that uh, uh, adequate definition of damage winds up being something uh, like a, a condition uh, of your product that you would not want the customer to see. This may be a relatively minor thing, as I mentioned earlier, aesthetic scuffing or minor misalignment of components, things like that. Some cases it might be okay, other cases not. There's no uh, simple answers, only the requirement to define the damage prior to testing. That's the important thing. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Edmund, you want to take it from here? Yes, yeah, certainly. Thank you, Herb. So the first hazard or the first damage that we're going to define is vibration, product vibration sensitivity measurement. And again, you ask yourself, why is vibration important? Vibration is important because 100% certain to occur. Vibration always happens. When you think about vibration, like I said, it always happens, but then impacts, on the other hand, they're a probability function only, which means that you know, it depends on the operator, depends on a manual function for that um, drop or impact to occur. Um, a lot of people actually do not consider the negative effects of vibrations but then when we hit resonance, which we'll talk a little more about later, but once we hit resonance, the effects and the, the, it can be pretty much disastrous and it will most likely destroy a lot of products, especially if they veer on the heavier side. And a lot of people don't think about that and consider that. And that the next point kind of sort of builds on the other point that if the product and package have the same natural frequency, your package is actually destroying your product and that's destructive packaging and when that happens fatigue damage is very very likely and with the global distribution right now products they only see more and more vibration in the distribution environment and the vibration exposure is greatly increased so when you do vibration sensitivity testing it consists of identifying the product resonant frequencies and amplification levels in the bandwidth of distribution and vehicles so just for an example truck and rail we see around 1 to 200 hertz and aircraft sees around 5 to 300 hertz and that's you could say the frequency bandwidth that you're concerned about when you're doing vibration testing and identification sensitivity so what is resonance Resonance is that characteristic of all structures analyzed as a spring mass system wherein the response to a vibration input is greater than the input itself. To make that um, pretty much in a short statement, it's when the response is greater than the input. You have likely experienced the annoying rattling of your car, for instance, when something's buzzing and you're wondering, Where, what is that? What is that? That's something known as resonance, and something and the frequency is matching the resonant frequency of that buzzing noise, and pretty much that's what you're hearing. Well, let me jump in here, uh, Edmund. The the, uh, the the reason we use uh, single degree of spring mass systems is because they're easy to study uh, in the laboratory and and to determine all the characteristics. Also, they they do a fairly good job of mimicking small components on products. So that's really what we're doing. We're we're not just uh, you know, shaking springs for the heck of it. Uh, we're actually using a spring mass system to model components of a product because all products are consist of elements that have flexibility and mass. 
And uh, when we put those two together, uh, uh, we have a, a spring mass system that we can then uh, study the input and the response and make uh, determinations such as the natural frequency, which you see at the top there. Uh, so for any spring mass system, you can determine its natural frequency. It's simply 1 over 2 pi times the uh, root of the, um, the uh, spring rate, K, times the gravity divided by, uh, by weight, uh, weight of the product, weight of the mass in that particular case. So it's a fairly easy thing to determine. It's very common, very natural. It happens all the time. Edmund? Thank you, Herb. So here's just a diagram of just other spring mass systems because let's be honest here. In the real world, you're not really going to work with a single degrees of freedom spring mass system. For instance, a single degrees of freedom spring mass system is a block of wood. You're not going to work with a block of wood when you're dealing with real products. So a lot of times you have other spring mass systems that are attached to many other springs. So if you look at these pictures here, um, it doesn't matter of the motion of it, but it's still a spring mass system. So you look at figure 1.4a, that's a typical single degree of freedom spring mass system. But same thing as B with the rod and disc and it's in a circular motion, still a spring mass system. And then with C, it's a pendulum motion, but still a spring mass system and it will also still has a resonant frequency. You know, the, let me jump in here. The, 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 uh, the, what those are showing are different modes of, uh, of how a spring uh, can uh, compress or expand. So uh, rather than tension and compression, uh, as we often think of springs, they, they can uh, twist. Uh, so you have a torsional motion, that was a diagram B, or a pendulum motion uh, uh, swinging back and forth like a uh, diving board or pendulum, things like that. Uh, so what we're trying to say here is it really doesn't matter the, uh, the type uh, of spring that you have uh, or the type of connection of that mass through the spring to a, a solid mass. They all work pretty much the same way. And the simplest one is a single degree of freedom. And that, that can be tension and compression. It could be twisting and a torsional motion. It could be bending uh, is in a pendulum motion. Okay, Edmund? Thanks for those insights, Herb. So here we have an example of something that you would normally see in the real world. And this diagram here looks like it's a diagram of a computer. So with the computer, you have a chassis, which is listed on the bottom. And that's the main, you could say, the main block that holds, holds everything else. But on the chassis, you have other components, like, for instance, a, a motherboard, which for some, oh, for the circuit board, which is the same thing as a motherboard. And then we also have a power supply on the chassis. And then we have memory housing and memory core mats. And even though we see right here we have seven springs, it's still not, quote, unquote, a true representation of what a uh, computer is because if you think about it, we also have RAM, we have a graphics card, we have hard drives, and that's all not accountable, accounted for in this diagram. But this is just a bare bones diagram of what a computer would look like if we were to diagram it with a spring mass system model. And really what we're trying to say here is, is that uh, the reason we use a single degree of freedom spring mass system uh, in our early studies of resonance is because the actual product itself modeled as you can see here is complex it has many springs many masses many different damping characteristics we'll talk about that in a minute uh, and they all interact um, in, in the real system so it, and it gets quite complex very quickly uh, so in order to help uh, understand uh, the, the, the concept initially we like to strip away as much of that complexity as we can and that's why we use a, a single degree of freedom system. We're not trying to say that's the real world by any means. That's not the case. What we are trying to say is that it's a fairly good representation of, of uh, small, simple things. And primarily, it's easy to study. That's why we do it. Okay. Let's go on. When, uh, uh, when we take a spring mass system and we excite it, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a, a, a few um kind of exceptions here, I'm going to say we excite the spring mass system on its base. In other words, we, we put a, a force into the base rather than on the mass itself. Okay. So, so when, when, we, uh, when we excite it on its base, the output of the, of the uh, vibration output, rather, uh, is what we call a transmissibility plot. So if we vary that, the frequency of the input and measure the response on the mass, and, and you can actually see that if you, if you uh, 
look uh, look on the spring mass system, you'll actually be able to see that. Um, so we're measuring the input and the response, and we're exciting the base. And as we continue to increase the frequency, what we'll find is that uh, initially the response and the input are approximately the same. So at low frequencies uh, below the resonance of that system, the response input ratio is approximately one. Um, and that is the response and input are pretty much equal. As the uh, forcing frequency, you know, exciting the base, continues to increase, the response of that spring mass system measured on the mass reaches a peak value, and that is what we call the natural frequency or resonance. Um, at, that, uh, as, at that frequency, uh, or as the frequency continues to increase, then the response uh, diminishes and uh, actually becomes less than the input. Uh, this is what's uh, referred to as attenuation, and the, uh, the mass, the response to the mass actually diminishes relative to the input. You'll also notice that the uh, unity zone of the transmissibility plot, uh, the input and the response, are in phase. In other words, uh, uh, they go up and down together. Uh, at resonance, the spring mass system of response is out of phase with the input um, and uh, 180 degrees, in fact. Uh, and continues that way for the remainder of the transmissibility plot. Another way to uh, define this so-called natural frequency of the system is to state that uh, resonance occurs when the forcing frequency, in other words, you're shaking the base, uh, equals the natural frequency of the spring under test. And the natural frequency is determined by, uh, by simply uh, exciting the mass and seeing how, it's, how it responds. Uh, if you're interested in, uh, in more information about how these various tests are run or the basic relationship of them, uh, we do have a, an advanced uh, uh, shock and vibration um, uh, seminar and, uh, or webinar, and, uh, and the, there's a set of slides that, that are on the website, and I would encourage you to look at those if you need more information or more background or more depth uh, in any of these areas. The whole purpose of this uh, vibration sensitivity testing is to determine the critical or natural frequencies uh, so those can be uh, properly attenuated. Uh, we're not particularly interested in uh, um, breaking things, uh, so we're, we're simply interested in identifying the, uh, the, the natural frequencies. A vehicle vibration that is uh, uh, outside of the range of the natural frequencies of our product uh, is, uh, is rarely uh, damaging uh, because the acceleration levels are relatively low. So the only time we're concerned about this is when the natural frequencies of the product are excited or uh, amplified either by the vehicle in which the product travels, uh, the cushion system surrounding the product, or both. And, and that's when damage is likely. Okay? Uh, it's actually possible to design a, a protective package system that uh, destroys the product. <laughs> this sounds kind of kind of strange, but it actually happens, and uh, Westpac has been involved in trying to to uh, fix a lot of those issues and to help uh, companies uh, prevent them initially as well. Okay. But this this normally occurs when the product natural frequency um, is uh, coincides with the cushion natural frequency as it's loaded. And if, uh, if you haven't done any testing before the product uh, ships, you're, you're, you're running a risk of actually doing that. Uh, so, and as I mentioned, the, the results can be absolutely disastrous. The, uh, the vibration test that we're talking about is relatively simple um, and, and straightforward. The, uh, the bare product in this test, test uh, is fastened to the table of a suitable vibration test machine. Uh, you can use electrohydraulic or electrodynamic machines. They, they all produce the same thing. And if you think about it, the product really doesn't know or care how you shake it. Okay, uh, It simply is going to respond uh, at its natural frequency. Uh, the fixturing of the product to the table of the vibration machine is critical uh, to help avoid uh, misleading results. And again, if you want more information on fixturing, uh, we have uh, information on that as well. But that's not the subject of our uh, webinar today, only to state that fixturing is important. Okay. 
So this system is subjected to uh, a low-level vibration input, and the response of those various monitored components, we're showing an A and B component in this product, uh, they're monitored, and the response is, is uh, displayed and recorded as a function of frequency. This will result in a transmissibility plot, such as we just recently showed you. Um, the uh, numbers uh, in the table to the right on this particular slide uh, show the uh, uh, some of the, uh, the results. So in a lateral direction, we show component B at 35 hertz. A longitudinal or the y-axis, we show uh, component A at 25 and 33. And the vertical axis, uh, uh, this particular component A has a uh, uh, 18 natural hertz frequency, and B doesn't have one. And you can see that B is supported from the ceiling. So when we shake that direction, the, the support will not allow it to stretch. Okay, so that would be a typical uh, characteristic or a typical type of uh, uh, result from a, a vibration transmissibility test. So to uh, to summarize, I'm going to ask uh, Edmund to uh, take it from here. Edmund. All right. So if we were to summarize vibration testing, what would we say? First off is that you definitely have to test all orientations where vibration input is possible. So if you're testing a package, that means testing in the X, Y, and Z, all three axes. And then for a pallet, usually you only test in the Z axis because you're only typically going to be shipping or in the up and down orientation or shaking the up and down orientation. You want to monitor all elements suspected of vibration sensitivity. And the way you do this, for lack of better terms, is that you would do a quote unquote, a wiggle test. So you would open up your unit and then you would just go around feeling every component and then if one shakes more than the other component you think okay this component here may break during shipment so we definitely want to monitor this and that's a, definitely a red flag the mass of the response transducer or accelerometer must be um, significantly less in weight than the mass of the monitored component just so it doesn't affect the resonance of the component you want to fixture your product to the vibration machine rigidly in a manner similar to how the package cushion might contact the product. You want to follow the general guidelines of ASTM D3580, and that's just pretty much vibration sensitivity testing and resonance search. And whether you excite your vibration or excite your unit with sinusoidal, random, or complex vibration, it doesn't really matter because theoretically your component will respond at its natural frequency because it can't really do anything else. Let me add a, a little bit uh, here on that last uh, uh, thing about we often get uh, questioned about whether or not people should uh, use sinusoidal or random and that kind of stuff. And as Edmund said, it's, in theory, it doesn't make any difference. And we do know that, uh, that random vibration will excite uh, uh, all natural frequencies within the product simultaneously, where sinusoidal vibration is only one at a time. And, and there can be some differences in the amplitude of the vibration response based on that. The, the actual natural frequency itself should be the same. Uh, again, if you want more information on that, or you want to dig deeper into the differences between those, uh, we do have an advanced uh, shock and vibration webinar available for you. Edmund, back to you. Thanks, Herb. So at the end of the day, when everything's said and done, what do, can you expect your end results to be? The end results of your testing, number one, you should have a clear identification of the natural frequencies within the product in all shippable orientations. Number two, you should have the lowest structural resonance of, in each orientation. And number two is important because with the lowest structural resonance, what happens is that if you end up protecting this resonant frequency, everything else that is above it automatically or just innately gets protected as well because everything else will be in the attenuation zone if you protect the lowest structural resonance. And third, your amplification level cues associated with each component each component's resonant frequency is also identified. So Q factor is pretty much tells you how much your product is seeing in comparison to the input. So typically, generally, um, Q levels of under 10 are desirable, and anything over 10 is just definitely a red flag, and you want to say, hey, you know, I'm inputting one right here in my vibration table, and my product is seeing 10, which is pretty substantial, to say the least. This uh, Q value that, um, that Edmund mentioned is actually the uh, response input ratio, and it's very closely related to uh, damping in the spring mass systems. And uh, some people have questioned us about that. And again, uh, 
it's uh, not something we're going to go over specifically during this webinar, but uh, it is an uh, explanation of the, of the damping factors are available uh, on the other webinars on our website. Edmund? Thanks, sir. So some additional vibration testing notes is that, number one, this test is relatively easy and quick to run, and it's definitely a non-destructive test. We're not trying to destroy anything here. We're just trying to identify the critical components and each of their resonant frequencies. Number two, like what Herb touched on already, is that vibration, uh, random vibration is definitely recommended over sinusoidal vibration because, one, it excites all frequencies and all harmonics simultaneously, so the effects of constructive and destructive interferences between the components are taken into account. When you ship anything real world, it's always going to be vibration, uh, random vibration. It's never going to be sinusoidal vibration. So exciting your spring mass system with random vibration, to say the least, is more, quote, unquote, realistic. If you end up doing sine vibration, it could actually result in an overtest because you're isolating frequencies. And then at the same time, if you do dwell testing at the resonance, it's also not recommended because now you have turned your vibration sensitivity test into a fatigue test. And this is not a fatigue test. This is only a test to identify your resonant frequencies or critical frequencies. So the purpose of the test is to stimulate the product spring mass system so the natural frequencies can be identified, not to simulate any kind of vehicle, to say the least. And that takes us to our first question and answer section. Tim, are there any questions from the audience? Hey, thank you, Edmund. Um, yes, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, Dale writes us and he asks, he or she, I'm not sure. Many of your pro many of your examples are electronic products. Do you take a different approach for fluid-filled consumer goods? Herb, can you take that one? Uh, and Dale's a he, so uh, at least last I checked, aren't you still a he, Dale? I, di I didn't say that. Okay. Um, getting back to the question, uh, do we take a different approach with liquid-filled products? And, and the answer is yes, because um, liquid-filled products don't uh, respond uh, to the, uh, uh, the, s the spring mass model that we're using as the basis uh, for this uh, the shock testing. If you remember, we, we, we kind of developed that spring mass model. So the answer is no. What we do for the products is that we uh, assume that the energy that goes into them full bore. In other words, we can't uh, we, we can't adjust the shape of the shock impulse that reaches the product, it just is subjected to an impact. And liquid products are rarely cushioned anyway. So what you would do in that case is, is uh, treat it in a velocity shock manner. In other words, all the testing would be done using a short duration half sign or some similar pulse to excite the velocity sensitivity portions of, the, of that product because that's, that's the only thing that you can affect. Uh, and unless you like putting, you know, cushions around uh, bottle uh, bottles of the liquid, which is normally not done. So this is a, it's, it's kind of a different area. It is related, and uh, we we did a lot of research with that in the early days uh, of, uh, you know, liquid filled containers, primarily uh, gallon uh, liquid plastic bottles with various kind of fluids in them. Uh, but the, the what you simply do is is to treat them with in a velocity shock manner and not in a uh, um, acceleration matter, and, and we'll go into that more, I, I think, uh, in depth in the second portion. Uh, Tim, are there any other questions? Oh, thanks, Herb. Yes, we have one more. Let me pass this one on to Edmund. Edmund, uh, Deepak asks us to explain amplification. How is it calculated? Thank you. Yes, I'd be more than happy to explain that answer. Hi, Deepak, how are you doing? And so amplification is mainly used for vibration. And then so when you're dealing with amplification, the equation is just response over input. Q is equal to response over input, where Q is equal to amplification. So with that said, it's a unitless ratio. So whether it's just displacement over displacement, acceleration over acceleration, um, your units cancel out. But what it really means is that what is your unit or the place that you're monitoring on your unit seeing with relationship to what is being inputted? So let me just give you this real life example. If you're vibrating your vibration table and it's moving one millimeter, 
and you see an amplification level of 10, it means that where you're monitoring your unit at, it's seeing 10 millimeters because it's 10 times the input. And that's simply amplification and mainly used for vibration. Thanks, Evan. That's a great explanation. What I think we ought to do is uh, get back into our webinar. We've got uh, another couple of questions here, and maybe we'll have time at the end. Um, Herb, I'm going to pass the mic to you. Thank you, Tim. Let's continue now with uh, our next uh, topic, which is uh, shock, or mechanical shock, as we'll say it. Um, we now move on to this, uh, this topic because it's uh, uh, one of the ones that most people think about. As we stated earlier, fragility is just another product characteristic, such as the size or the mass or the color. Uh, in the days gone by, fragility assessment utilized a shock response spectrum analysis uh, to determine the sensitivity of products to various types of shock inputs. This was a difficult and a tedious task. Shock response to spectrum analysis um, looked at the response of a, of a shock system, of a, of a spring mass system, rather, uh, to any kind of input and made a response based on the uh, type of input that was uh, recorded. So this, this uh, was an architectural tool used to determine the structural integrity of buildings and bridges and things of that type. Uh, it was very useful and still is used today, by the way. Uh, for these these uh, types of events and eventually found its way into the early uh, fragility testing done primarily by the military. But it was quite complex. Uh, again, it depended on the, the uh, relationship between the uh, input pulse and the responding system. Uh, and uh, those relationships were either relatively simple based on a velocity shock or vel relatively complex uh, if the... Uh, the shock could be characterized as an acceleration pulse. Okay. This uh, sensitivity, or this complexity rather, was uh, recognized in the early uh, to mid-1960s by people trying to do this kind of testing. Uh, Dr. Robert Newton at the Naval Postgraduate School was tasked with uh, simplifying the whole process. Uh, and uh, he came up with the uh, damage boundary test procedure that many of you are familiar with. So basically, he took the SRS, as, uh, as you see here, uh, and uh, in its complexity, and divided it up into two regions. Uh, one region is this area on the far left side of the plot, and that's referred to as the velocity shock region. In this area, um, the spring mass system that we're talking about responds only to the uh, energy content, I'm going to call it. It's not actually energy because there's no uh, no mass in the, in the structure, uh, in the equation rather, but it can be thought of as energy. In this particular region, the uh, the unit the spring mass system responds very sluggishly because the shock is over and done with before the system can respond, and the relationship between the incoming and outgoing pulse is about one six. In other words. Uh, the responding system is uh, six times longer uh, or lower in frequency than the input. It would be like uh, uh, like like uh, hitting uh, your head with a hammer, for example, or some other rigid object, and you can produce uh, very large acceleration levels well above the fragility of your head, but it's over and done with so fast that your head just doesn't have a chance to respond. Uh, out in this uh, acceleration region, from here on out, the system... The spring mass system responds in a complex manner depending on the relationship of the uh, input and responding frequency, okay? and that uh, the response can hit uh, amplitude levels of two uh, times or more, two times for a single degree of freedom spring mass system, uh, or more for multiple degree of freedom spring mass systems. And again, it depends on the shape of the wave. So you have a different shape for the half sine, different shape for square wave, and different shape for trapezoidal pulses, and it gets complex after that. Okay. Robert Newton, uh, was a, his a genius was that he was able to uh, divide these areas by two very simple shock pulses, one uh, being the velocity shock pulse, which was nothing more than a short duration a half sine pulse. The reason he chose that is because uh, the shape of the pulse is not 
uh, important to a spring mass response in this region. So half science, easy to program, as long as it's very short, which means high frequency. And then for the, the uh, acceleration portion, he chose this, uh, what we call a square wave. It's not really a square wave. It's a trapezoidal pulse because it has finite rise and decay time. Okay. So it's more of a trapezoid. But what it will do is it, uh, it maximizes the response of a spring mass system so that the response, uh, the numbers that you get, are conservative. In other words, if this product can withstand, or the spring mass system can withstand a 40G, which is what this is showing here, 40G uh, input using a square wave or trapezoidal pulse, it can uh, withstand the same input from any shape pulse half sine, trapezoidal, triangular wave, doesn't matter, okay? So if you use these two methods, these two pulses, you can completely encapsulate the entire system. And that was the, uh, the brilliance, as I'm gonna call it, of the uh, uh, damage boundary uh, test method, okay? So I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, Edmund now, and he's gonna talk about uh, the flow chart, how we get, uh, get, get pro our processed way through this whole thing, Edmund? Thanks, Herb. So when you look at the damage boundary, here's just a quick, you could say, bare bones diagram of what you'll do. So at the start of testing, you're going to determine the shock level of your unit. So for instance, um, 20 Gs. And after you determine the shock level, we're going to shock the actual unit. And then after the shock, we, you're going to inspect your unit for either physical damage or and functionality. And with physical damage, pretty much anything to the naked eye and say cosmetically and then functionality you're going to power cycle your unit make sure it does all the everything it's supposed to do and then based on the results of that you could either increment the shock and what that means is that when you increment the shock level no damage was seen and it quote unquote passed that level so after it passed that level you increment the shock level and then you just do the same thing over again and then you would shock at the new determined level after you shock at the new determined level, again, you would inspect for physical and functionality. So let's just say you had a failure after that, and you would actually damage, um, document the damage. So you would say the chassis broke at 80 Gs. And then after you document that, you have a couple of options. So if you have an additional units available, you could either, one, retest at that same level, and any time that you retest at the same level, you're trying to rule out fatigue damage because you're shocking from a very small level and then you're slowly incrementing it. And by the time your unit sees failure, it might have seen 10 shocks already. So that's only if you're testing at the same orientation. But what's more common in the industry is that you actually just change the orientations. So you determine that in the z-axis, it fails at 40 Gs. Now we're gonna see what your, um, what your product fails at in the x-axis. And after that, you would do everything again, and you would determine shock level and wash, rinse, and repeat until you've completed everything that you need completed. So again, this is just a very bare bones type of flow chart for the damage boundary. So here's a damage boundary graph when you could say testing is completed. So with this, your first test that you do on that number one here means that nothing really happened because in the damage, it's not in the damage region. So it passed functional testing, it passed all your cosmetic checks, and with this number one, we're actually doing the velocity shock, which is the half sign shock that Herb was talking about um, a couple slides back. So first shock is done and nothing happens. So you're retesting it, but this time in a higher level, and that's where number two comes in. And number two, nothing happens again, everything passed, flying colors, and we're just going to shock on until it actually hits the damage region. So finally, at shock number seven, we see damage, some type of damage. Like I said, your chassis cracked or something. And that's the failure observed. And that is known as a critical velocity change of your unit. And critical velocity change, what it simulates is the in-use environment or of your product. So after you unpackaged your laptop and then you drop it three inches and it broke. So that's a critical velocity change. And based on the critical velocity change, you get this value and you multiply it by 1.7, 1.57 here to um, get out of, quote unquote, the elbow of, or the void region of the damage boundary because you want to avoid this region just because 
data in here gets really, really hard to interpret because you don't know if it's really a velocity region or an acceleration region. So you multiply the critical velocity change by 1.57 at a very minimum. But more commonly is that we just multiply it by 2, which is somewhere over here, just to make sure that we're way past that void region. So now we moved on to critical acceleration testing. And what the critical acceleration testing simulates is that in a package environment, the distribution environment, so this is your package or your product going through the distribution environment and when you're actually shipping your product. So the first test, again, green, flying colors, everything passed. Second test, everything passed. You increment the level. Third test, everything passed. Again, we're going to increment your chalk level. And finally, with the fourth test, we see some more damage. And let's just say right now it's not a cosmetic damage, but it's actually a functional failure your LCD doesn't turn on or it doesn't you know, it doesn't power cycle anymore. But either way, it failed and that's known as a critical acceleration value or where it's going to fail if it was in a package. So here is just a picture or a couple pictures of shock testing and what we would use to do the damage boundary testing. So if you look at your product on both pictures, but let's look at the one on the left is that the product is securely uh, fastened to the table because you definitely don't want your product to go flying off the table when you do the shock. But the shock table raises up the hoist and then it free fall drops to give you a shock pulse, to say the least. So if you look at the picture on the right, that's a free fall drop on a shock tester being um, recorded and it's blurry because it went up and down pretty much. So the end results of shock testing. At the end of the day, when you do finish your damage boundary testing, your critical velocity change, delta V sub C, tells us the maximum drop height of the bare product can withstand before the product damage. And like I said, this simulates the in-use environment after everything is unpackaged. And with this, delta V is equal to 1 plus e times the square root of 2gh, where e is the coefficient of restitution of the impact surfaces, and g is the gravitational constant, and h is the drop height. And then secondly, the critical acceleration value, the a sub c, is the design criteria for the optimal protective package system. So this is the value that you're going to take to your packaging um, designer, packaging supplier, and say, hey, my product broke at 60 g's. I need a 60G pack, and then they will take care of it from there and design your package theoretically so it doesn't see 60Gs based on a drop height of your desire. And this is Herb, and he's going to close out the webinar for us. Thanks, Edmund. So guess what? We've just quantified this bar. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the two numbers that Edmund talked about just recently are very important. The critical uh, velocity change, as he said, tells us the drop height that the bare product, This is remember this is a bare product test, that the drop height that the bare product can withstand before failure occurs, drop height onto a rigid surface. Uh, that's very handy to know at the, because your product will handle, will be able to, uh, will be exposed to rather some level of uh, handling during its normal operating mode. Uh, and so these numbers will tell you how far this product can drop onto a table surface, for example, before damage will occur, whether or not the product can withstand a, a, a drop off the counter. Many of you carry cell phones and many of you have dropped them off a counter and hopefully uh, not too many of you have had that cell phone damaged, although I, I can test, testify that it, it can happen. My point is that this testing will tell you whether or not that product is likely to fail uh, during a certain rigid impact. So velocity change is most closely associated with drop height. Uh, in fact, there's drop height right in the equation, as you saw. Uh, the coefficient of restitution that, that uh, Edmund talked about, the E value, uh, varies from 0 to 1. Uh, you can choose a conservative number just to be on the safe side, or you can choose an average number. An average number is like uh, 0.5. Um, but my point is that it's a very useful number. And again, if you need to know more about 
philosophy change, how it's programmed, things like that. Our advanced uh, uh, webinar series on the website will give you more information about it. The critical acceleration number, likewise, is a very valuable number for the package designer and logistics engineer, supply chain manager, all those kind of folks, because that's the number that, that uh, tells you what kind of cushion demands this product uh, uh, will make on, on uh, its package system. In other words, what is its fragility? And that's exactly what a cushion does. It limits or filters the shock input to a level below the fragility of the product. Well, now that we know exactly what that is, this testing tells us exactly what that is. That's what the quantification of this bar, this product bar on the bar chart in front of you says. So by those means, we're able to say, this is, this is exactly what we need. That's the, that's the level that we need. We're able to quantify it, put numbers on it so that we can tell exactly where that is, how, uh, and we know how we got it, uh, things like that. You can see that uh, as we move further on, that uh, the product package system then demands that we know what that product is, that we can make some choices about whether or not we under package or over package the product or optimally package. Okay, and that's, that's exactly what this is just trying to show. So quantifying the product uh, sensitivity to dynamic inputs is critical, and that's the whole purpose of today's webinar, to, to tell you exactly how we go about doing that. Now, I'll have to be very honest with you, we skipped over a lot of stuff. Uh, we didn't skip it over. We certainly didn't dwell on it because you just can't teach this kind of stuff in an hour. It's just not possible. But at least you get an idea and an understanding that it can be done of some of the things involved. And if you have specific questions about it, then you know who to go to, to ask, uh, you know, with the books. To, and believe me, we'll, we'll be very, very happy to answer your questions about this. Uh, don't uh, don't hesitate to ask. We've all started our life wondering how in the world we're going to do something from a fragility standpoint, and eventually we figure that out. So I hope that that's a whole lot clearer, that that's exactly what we did just now, was quantify this bar right here. Uh, and, uh, and this damage boundary method uh, of a shock fragility assessment and the vibration sensitivity uh, techniques that we talked about, the resonance search product uh, uh, procedure, that's exactly how we go about doing it. Okay. Let's summarize. Um, the damage boundary shock test is a destructive test. And that, uh, the reason we mention that is because this is different from the uh, vibration uh, sensitivity testing where we do not take the product to failure. We simply determine its vibration characteristics. But the uh, damage boundary uh, shock test shock fragility analysis is destructive. Products are taken to the failure level. That, that is, we test them until they break. Um, therefore, a, a rigorous test would require uh, one test in each axis, X, Y, and Z, plus or minus X, Y, and Z, so that's six orientations. And then you have both velocity change and acceleration for each of those. So the total of 12 specimens are required for a rigorous test. Now, I don't want to give the impression that it requires 12 <laughs> prototype products uh, prior to production for, uh, for each rigorous test. Um, the simple fact is, if you went and you asked your boss for 12 products to destroy prior to sending them out, they'd probably get kicked out of the office or out of the building. Uh, and over my 35 or 40 years of doing this, I've only had five or six different instances where we've actually done it rigorously. So much information can be gained from a limited number of specimens. Uh, and that's often done, even though none of the literature says, says so. But that's simply how it's done. So that's something you should keep in mind. You don't need to take the products necessarily to failure in order to get good information. You simply need to test them to a certain minimum level. Uh, fixturing of the uh, test specimens during the shock testing is critical. Um, it's also more art than science, quite honestly. So make sure that you do a reasonably good job of that. Uh, ask questions if you're not sure. Uh, in general, what we try to tell people is that the fixture should mimic uh, the, the uh, grabbing onto or the holding of the product in a similar fashion to what the cushion would do. It's kind of putting the cart before the horse because you don't have the cushion design yet, done yet, because you don't have the fragility numbers yet. Uh, and, and you get it from this test. 
but you can generally use th those guidelines, if you will, for how a cushion might grab onto the product with either end caps or corner caps or, or some other type of uh, flat cushion design. Another thing to remember is the use of the trapezoidal, or sometimes referred to as a square wave pulse, for the uh, critical acceleration test is conservative. It results in a worst case number for the critical acceleration. So if the product passes a, pick a number, 50 G square wave test, it'll pass 50 Gs of any kind of waveform. doesn't matter. Uh, the other way around is not true. So if you pass a 50 G half sign test, it may not pass a 50 G square wave test. It probably won't because that's why we use it. It's conservative. And then also remember, a lot of people forget this uh, to their own detriment. The critical velocity change and critical acceleration numbers are input numbers. In other words, uh, these are the quantities that uh, come from the test equipment um, going into the product during these tests. Uh, when you finally create a package system and you put the product in there and you test to see if it's going to work correctly, you can only generate response numbers. Well, those can be very different and often are. So the, there are ways around that, uh, uh, and we'll talk about those again in the, in the advanced class. Uh, or if you have any questions about them during the question and answer period, we can do that, that there. But remember that the input numbers are the ones that, that uh, are used to create the, uh, the, the numbers that we generate in the uh, velocity and uh, critical acceleration tests, uh, as well as the vibration as well. Uh, but the only thing you can measure in a package test is the response. And again, they might be quite different. So there you have it. I know a lot of information. Um, Please uh, look at it carefully and uh, keep it handy so you can re reference it when you're actually in the situation. Uh, but that's all that we have on, on, the, uh, on this particular topic. So thank you for your input. Um, so if, if, if before we get uh, too far into those things, I want to find out if there's any questions from our audience about uh, uh, any of the topics covered here or even some of the ones that weren't. So uh, Tim, do we have any questions from our audience? Thanks, Herb. We're uh, pretty much out of time, but Deepak asked one classic question that I know others are going to be interested in your answer to, and that is this. If you would only have one unit to conduct the testing with, how would you do it? How would you get actionable data from one test, uh, testing one unit? Over to you, Herb. Uh, thanks, Tim, and, and thanks to Deepak for the question because it's very relevant. Uh, most of the testing I have been, been uh, fortunate enough to do over the years uh, on uh, damage boundary uh, fragility analysis involved only one product. So uh, I didn't have the luxury of having 12 products. So first of all, I assumed that a package would be necessary. And if that's, if that's the case, then uh, I don't need a critical velocity test. Uh, because that, that just simply tells me the, uh, the bare product characteristics on a rigid surface. I'm not interested in that right now. I'm interested in, in uh, uh, what the cushion design has to be. So uh, instantly I eliminate six of the products. Now, what do I lose in that? Well, I lose the ability to get the exact velocity change. So during the critical acceleration test, I simply use a conservative number, um, 200 inches per second or 250, something like that. So th that will get me where I need to go. Uh, and then for the critical acceleration test, since I only have one product, what I do is uh, select a fairly low level, and it might be, uh, depending on the product, it might be 25 Gs or 50 Gs, depending on its size and its ruggedness, things like that. And I'll test it in all orientations at that level. So I, I do 50 Gs in all orientations, and then step up the acceleration level to some reasonable, I might go to 60 Gs or I might go to 30 Gs depending on, on what the situation demands and test all orientations in that level. So eventually I'll, I'll cause a failure and I will use that failure number, let's call it the 65 Gs to put a number on it, for all orientations. Now I know that, that uh, there are some of those orientations that are more rugged than that, but I know that if I use 65 Gs that I'll be uh, safe. Uh, sometimes I will be able to use that as a, an opportunity to go back and optimize that package system in uh, you know, six months or a year, depending on, on the, the uh, circumstances, so that um, I can you know, get some cost reduction on the darn thing. But at least I know I'm not going to have uh, failure levels going out in the field uh, based on that procedure. So it's conservative, 
but if I my back against the wall and I only have one product, what else am I going to do? So it's a good question, and and that's what I've done over the years. Other people I've talked to uh, in a similar situation have done something very very similar to that as well. Um, so that's how you do a damage boundary with simply one product. You're you're a little more conservative and you test all orientations at the same level and then step up the acceleration level. Okay, well, back to you, Tim. Okay, Herb, that was great. A uh, great way to um, summarize the um, lot of issues in, in one one little uh, address there. So let's uh, close out the webinar. Um, I wanted, want you to know about our next webinar. Um, the, uh, the next packaging dynamics webinar in the series is number four. It's going to be on um, cushion, dynamic cushion testing and shock absorption. Um, before we get to that one, though, in June, on the 25th of June, we're going to have a webinar on reliability testing. So I expect to receive an email from us inviting you to that. Our uh, lab manager, Mike Brown, and Herb are going to address uh, reliability. And uh, finally, I want to thank you for uh, participating with us today. If you'd like to listen to the webinar again or download the slide deck, uh, go to our, our website uh, as early as tomorrow to the resources tab and you'll find today's webinar as well as all the webinars we've done uh, right there. You can download them and listen to them and share them with your colleagues. Within the hour you're going to receive a, a survey request. It should only take you about two minutes, um, or if that actually. I call it the 17 second survey request. So. Uh, please uh, give us your thoughts about today's webinar, and most of all, give us your ideas for future webinar topics. I want to thank you again for joining us today. Again, I'm Tim Eels, um, and make it a great day. <laughs>